Arch Obler's plays. On the winds of the night, we bring you a story whispered in the night. Three short plays of the ways of men, past, present, and future. First, the past. The time, one of our yesterdays. The place, the main square of the village. It had once been a tree-circled gathering point for the women and old men to sun themselves. On its clean pavements, the children had played. But now the trees stand charred and broken. Blocks of jagged masonry lie piled in empty disorder. There is no village, only hovels clustering on the edge of great shell-blasted craters. One thing alone rises complete, shining new in the early morning sun, a crudely fashioned statue of a man. And before this statue stand a small boy and a bent old man. The boy speaks. But were there so many people before the trouble, Grandfather? The people? Yes, yes. Hundreds and hundreds of people. The square here would be filled with them of a sunny day. The old ones sitting, the young ones strolling, the children playing. Hundreds, I tell you. Hundreds. And were there many boys like me in the village then? Aye, that there were. Playing their games, marching around and around to the music of the band. Band? Aye, band. Before the trouble. The band that played and told our men they had to fight. Fight whom, Grandfather? Our enemies, of course. Kill or be killed, the poster said. March on the enemy for the glory of the eternal state. Oh, yes. That's what the poster said all over the town. I, it's as if I hear them now. The band playing here in the square. The women talking war talk. The men seizing their guns. Aye, guns. All but one. Jan Pero. And him they hated. Hated. Confronted band. Shut the window. Just come the door. Now then, young men, we will settle your case. I am waiting, Your Excellency. Speak only when I tell you to. As you say, Your Excellency. <clears throat> your name? Jan. Jan Piero. Hmm. Occupation? I am a farmer. My land is just beyond the furthest hill. Family? Wife and child. Hmm. According to this report, you have refused to join the armies of the state. Is that true? I have never denied it. Then what they say is true. You are afraid to die. Give me a reason to die. Reason? Are you such a fool that you have not understood what even the children in the street are saying? That even now our enemies prepare to crush us? Yeah, that is what they say. Enemies! They must strike them down. They must attack for the glory of our homes and wives and children. It's such an old tune. Eh? My father, and his father before him, done start his life to it. But our enemies prepare. They hate us. Men, women, and children. But why do our enemies hate us? Because, because... I'll tell you. Because of that great victory won in my father's time. And in that victory were sown the seeds of this new war you ask me to die in. Oh, don't you understand? Silence. Orly. Where you come, The Burgermeister. Send him in. One commandant. Your Excellency, I... I know I... I am only a farmer. No! But I... I won't listen to you, Jan Perro. I know your sort. Talk, talk, talk. Until a man's head spins in the middle like a top. Burgermeister, Your Excellency. Come in, Burgermeister. Come in. Yes, yes, Your Excellency. Whatever I can do for you. You can do nothing for me. Here is your Jan Perro. See that he listens to reason. I give you two minutes. Well, Jan, burger my stand. Oh, you, you won't disgrace us, Jan. Why won't you listen to me? If I fight, if we fight, 
There will be no victory. Oh, we'll win a glorious victory. I say win or lose, there will be no victory. The hatred fighting breeds does not die with a victory. It lives on in the hearts of the defeated. Protect your home and loved ones, young. But we have not been attacked. No, Burgomaster. Protect my son and my son's sons from dying. That's what I'll do. I will not fight. I will not fight. I will not fight. Oh, yeah. Young. Young. Do not weep, little wife. But I heard... What you heard were only words the commandant squeezed to frighten me. I spoke only the truth, my wife. He knows I did. Young. Do what they say. You want me to... to go to war? Because you cannot stand people's empty words? Everyone is going, Jan. You must, too. Anna, my silly little one. You don't know what you're saying. Do what they say, Jan. Do it. No. You are afraid. You are. Anna. Afraid to fight. To protect your home, your wife, your child. Afraid. Yes. Yes. I am afraid. Afraid? But not afraid of what you think, my wife. Not afraid of the quick death of a smashing bullet in my head. No. no not afraid of the slow death. The squirming in the mud of a stinking trench. With my blood pouring from me like a burning fire. I tell you, I am not afraid to die in battle, my wife. I am afraid that I might not die. Eh? What? I'm you... afraid that I'd live through this war... And uh, come back and see the years go by and watch the next war brewing. Watch my son fed with the lies they are trying to feed me. Watch the new hates growing in those other lands. The hates my rifle had helped shoot into their hearts and minds. That's what I'm afraid of, my wife. That's why I will never fight. That's why I'll never fight. Jan, Jan, they're coming for you. Eh? For, for me? Uh, oh, no. Jan Fellow. Eh? Yeah, what? By order of the Emergency Military Tribunal, you are to be executed on the charge of high treason. That execution to take place at once. Jan! Jan! <laughs> Behind me. All of my church. Ah, blank hold the prisoner. No, 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 wait. I want to see them. There's a crowd there. Look. They were my friends. Uh, you there, Eric. I see you. Why do you call me names? We were in school together. You were my friend. Uh, please understand me. Uh, you there, Hans. Remember the long talks we had together of beauty and the brave new life? You, Hans. Tell them what I mean when I say that war. No. No, they will not listen. You see, Commandant, look at them. My friends. Even the thought of war. And already they are not men of the soil, men of the shops, but things of hate. And that hate will not stop when the terms of peace are signed. It cannot stop. Another moment. Brothers of my village, listen to me. Before those bullets tear me open, listen to me. I have lived with you, walked with you, all the years of my life. And if my life is ending now, here among you, that is good. Better my blood soak into this, my native soil, than in another land. My blood that flows here, ends here. But yours, 
Yours will flow like a great river of hate, joining the hate of our fathers and our enemies until it is a great sea washing over all the world, blotting it out like a flood. Do not give your blood to that sea of hate, my countrymen. Do not fight, and there will be no war. Fight, and there will be no peace. For in the peace you dictate will be our children's war. And when that new war comes, it will rain from the sky. A great green choking cloud. It will blot out the village. All men will grovel in burrows beneath the ground with their women like hunted things. The great city, the men will crash. Wolves will howl among the broken things we call our glory. Violence breeds violence, my brothers. There can be no peace through war. There can be no peace through war. There can be no peace So he died, young Pero, many years ago. Died against a church wall that was dust long before the day of trouble. The day when all that he said came true and the world went up in flames of hate. But this statue, Grandfather. This statue? Oh, yes. Frederick the Blind and I... We were the only men left in all the village. We made it with our own hands. Look close and read the words, my son. Read. It, it says, To the memory of Jan Pero, the bravest man in all the village. the second in our short plays of the ways of men, a story of the present. The scene aboard the U.S. destroyer Liberty somewhere in the Mediterranean. It is dusk. The usual disciplined calm of the battleship has been broken for the past half hour by a minor tragedy of the sea. In the heavy fog, a small fishing skiff had been cut down by the lunging prow of the destroyer. At the moment, the senior officer is making his report to the commandant. No doubt, sir from the testimony of the men on deck, that not only was the skiff operating without a foghorn, but she didn't have a light on it either, on or aft. That's all very well, Lieutenant. But what I want to know is, how about the boy? Oh, he's all right, sir. Not a thing wrong with him. Raising the devil good and proper, that he is, sir. Eh? What do you mean? Well, sir, it's a boat he wants. A boat? Aye, sir, a boat. The minute he hit the deck, he began yelling for a boat in place of the one we ran down. Put him below deck until morning. Oh, but that won't help, sir. It's the baby that's got us worried. Baby? Why, sir, baby, sir. The one the lad brought with him. Ten or twelve months old is how I rate it. Lieutenant, perhaps you're not aware that I saw the boy brought over the side. He was alone. Aye, sir, alone. But all the time he had this kid, I mean this baby, wrapped up snug under his coat. Didn't know it was there, we didn't. Until all at once he takes it out and starts dressing it in the dry stuff we gave him. Well, I'll be... Aye, sir. Whose baby is it? Who's the boy? What was he doing out here in the fog in a small boat without running lights? Well, that's just it, sir. He won't tell us. Eh? Just keep yelling for a boat right away, quick. Kid under one arm and waving his fist, yelling to see the captain. It's one hell of a mess, sir. There, sir. Do you hear him? Send him in. Aye, sir. You, boy. The commander will see you. In here. In here. This is him, sir. I mean, them, sir. Very good, Lieutenant. Aye, sir. Come closer, boy. Boy, can't you do something about that that child? You are the captain, senor. Oh, Commander Roberts. Now that baby, can't you do something about him? Huh? Quiet, little fellow. This is the captain. He will help us. Quiet, little sister. Well, he... She, uh... Certainly listens to you. As you will listen to me, Captain. A boat. You will give me a boat. I must have a boat quickly. Do not stand there. All right, boy. It's about enough of that. You'll be taken care of. 
you mean that, senor? Certainly. Then you will give me a boat now? Boy, try and understand. This is a government ship. I am sure proper compensation will be made for your loss. The, the words, senor, all of them I do not understand. This I know. A boat. Give me a boat, senor. There is no time. We must go. Stop we... that. Did you hear me? I said you'd be taken care of, you and your sister. We'll get you back where you belong. Is that clear? A hole in the ground. Eh? A hole in the ground is good enough for me, senor. But my sister, I do not think even you would want that for her. What are you talking about? You said you will take us back where we came from. Well? The bombs made great holes, senor. Where are you from? Aquila. Oh. My sister asks you to. You will give us another boat, senor? Your... Family? I told you, senor, I told you. Hole in the ground. I'm sorry. Aguila. It's 200 miles from the sea. Battle area. Boy, how did you manage to... You don't mind answering a few questions, do you? Questions? Questions, senor? You ask me? No. I have questions I have wanted to ask for many days. You have gray hair. You are old. They always tell me the old are wise. So now you tell me, senor. What? Senor, why did they die? Oh. Well, uh, it's a war, boy. Uh, uh, difference of ideas. Uh, someday you'll understand. Understand, senor? What is there to understand? Have they understood to milk the cow? Jimenez understood how to make baskets to sell in the marketplace. Teresa... She understands how to beat the clothes white on the stones of the river. Juana, how to take care of her five children. But war, senor. It was so good in our village. The sun so bright, the air so clear. What had we to do with war? Make me understand, senor. Why are they all dead? Well, uh, civil war, as I said, uh, difference of ideas, uh... How can I explain? My papa tells me many things. He talked to me of a world where men think free and talk free. Where, where everyone has his own land. Not too much. And men are like brothers. Is this why my papa is dead, senor? Is this why bombs drop from the sky? Boy, listen to me. No, senor. You do not know. You are not wise. No one who is old is wise. I must go. Hey, boat, senor, give me of my boat. Boy. Listen to her, senor. Our village was full of such laughter. Where is it now? Only Maruha and me. But her I take away. To some place where there is nobody old and wise to drop bombs on her. So that's where you were sailing. See, si, see. Si. We came so far until I found the boat. Then the sea. We were so happy. But once your ship, so fast, I could not get us out of the way. She is so little, senor. So pretty. And she is afraid. She never cry. Just look at me like she say, Brother, you take good care of me. And I will take it. I will. Give me a boat, senor. Give me a boat. All right, boy. It'll be all right. Senor? This is your boat. Mine? I'll take you to a place where... where, God willing, you and your sister will be safe. You... You know such a place, senor? Yes. We're not so old there. We haven't forgotten that liberty is not a gift, but a victory. Look, senor, she has gone to sleep, my sister. It was because now she knows I can take care of her. Take her outside, boy. The lieutenant will give you a place to sleep. Gracias, senor. You are good. I thought there was no one left who was good. Gracias, senor. Sleep well, boy. Following addition to message sent to flagship, quote, 
in Reese Skip, run down in fog. There were two survivors, a boy and a baby. We are proceeding on course. We are taking children home. Time, 20,000 years from tomorrow. <laughs> Excuse me, please. I know it isn't polite. I, I can't help it. It's the funniest thing. <laughs> Wait until you hear it. Absolutely the funniest thing. <laughs> Yes, I'll tell you. A hoax. He tried to play a hoax on me, telling me it was an authentic record of their times and expecting me. <laughs> me to believe. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait a moment, wait a moment. I'll start from the beginning. Really, I will. And then you'll laugh with me. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> well, it started like this. An old man comes to my study a little while ago, a package under his arm, and he tells me he's a student of the past. <laughs> Past master of the humbug, that's what he meant. Wait until you hear it. So, so he has this package under his arm, and he says to me breathlessly, Kind sir, I've brought you the most wonderful relic of the past the modern world has ever known. Really, I said, what are you talking about, and who are you? He answers, A lonely traveler, one who wanders in far-off places. <laughs> far-off places? And that's what he told me. And so I said, And is this that you are bringing me from one of these far-off places? He nods his head like a strutting rooster. He says, Yes, indeed. You are the greatest living scholar of the history of the old world. So it is fitting that I bring this to you. Indeed, I said. And what have you got? And where did you find it? He says, I was walking through the mountains beneath which the great city once stood. Well, I said, well, he said, As you know, thousands of years ago, there was another civilization that reached great heights. Yes, I know, I know, I said. Certainly you're not going to teach me history, my ancient friend. He said... Oh, no, no, indeed. I only meant to say what I found high in the mountain. It is a written record of that civilization. The first written record ever to be found. For a moment, I couldn't breathe. I just looked at him. I said, have you gone out of your head with age, old man? I just looked at him. I said, have you gone out of your head with age, old man? Nothing is left of that prehistoric time. First the sea covered them and the dark planet swung close and then the molten rock thrust up. It is only our theory that men had a civilization here before us. For answer, he tore the paper off the package. He said, look, these papers, reality, I tell you, high in the mountains inside a piece of alabaster that must have protected it from the ravages of time, miraculously spewed up from the earth when the mountains rose up through the land. Look, sir, and read a record of their times, a record of the ways of men 20,000 years before our civilization came into being. <laughs> yes, yes, he said that. And I took the book, took it in my hand, and read. For a moment, I almost believed the fraud. Strange formations of letters and strange words and meanings, but clear enough to me. <laughs> Clear enough. The cleverest fraud a faker ever tried to perpetrate. <laughs> now, wait. Hey, let me tell you what was in that historical book. He tried to tell me that he'd found the old humbug. <laughs> Listen to this. First, the book said... Wait until you hear this. First, the book said that the men of that past civilization fought about the land. <laughs> you don't understand what I mean? I mean the world. They fought each other, maimed each other, bled each other over who owned what pieces of the world. Did you ever hear such nonsense? They knew how large the world was, and they knew how many men were in it, 
But instead of dividing it up fairly, or all owning together as one, they fought each other. <laughs> yes, bloody wars for years and years. Did you ever hear such humbug history? <laughs> and that is no. The book said that they fought each other over race. Yes, race, race. The book says the word means the difference between men. And then the book said that all men have the same origin. And yet, <laughs> they killed each other over a difference they admitted didn't even exist. <laughs> oh, what a fraud, that book. <laughs> and a man walked that world for a little while who said... For the glory of God, peace on earth. And he spoke truth. And men listened and said, We believe. <laughs> and then went out to murder with bright music playing. Music, I tell you. <laughs> and then a little man arose who said, For the glory of the state, war on earth. And he spoke lies. And men knew there were lies, and he knew they knew. But again, they went out to murder with the music playing. <laughs> oh, oh. And here's the funniest. Other men saw what was happening. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> let them kill. It is not to our interest. <laughs> and the flame of murder came closer. And still they said, it is not our interest. <laughs> As if the house were afire, and they said we will not use water until we ourselves are burning. <laughs> and here's the climax. The preposterous book said that these, <laughs> these crazy people who filled the earth in those days had machines. Machines with which to fly through the air. Yes, really, through the air. <laughs> but imagine the wonder if it were true. Speeding through the air like the birds' great glistening machines to carry men to new wonders. <laughs> Guess what the fraud of the book said they did with them? <laughs> I can hold your sides when you hear this. They loaded them up with horrible tearing things and flew up over the crowded places <laughs> and dropped them. Yes, believe me. <laughs> the humbug history tried to make me believe that was the truth. They struggled for centuries. Men studied, toiled, rivers of heartache, said the book, trying to make a healthier world for their children to live in. And then they throw poison clouds down from the sky and kill them off in tens of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Kill the children. <laughs> Isn't it all a joke? These three plays of The Ways of Men were written especially for radio by Arch Obler. The first play, Memoriam, featured Bill Johnston. The second play, Soul Survivors, Jack Kelk and Ray Collins. And the last play, Humbug, featured Raymond Edward Johnson. Next week, we bring you Mr. Important, a sentimental fantasy with Mr. Martin Gable. Obler's Plays. On the winds of the night, we bring you a story whispered in the night.
Arch Obler's plays are presentations of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.